Good morning. It is really good to see all of you, and it is great to be back in Shanghai after such a long time. Uh, last time I was in Shanghai was about four years ago, and I thought I would be coming back the next year. Uh, and here we are, four years later, uh, finally getting back together. Uh, it's also great to be in China. Uh, I've been here all week. Uh, I went to, was in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, meeting with uh, different open source organizations. Uh, also meeting with amazing developers here in China. Uh, every time I come here, my favorite thing to do is meet the wonderful software developers in China that work in open source and work on so many innovative solutions, products, uh, it's just great. Uh, yesterday I was at Tencent uh, and I met with some of their kernel, Linux kernel engineers who've uh, reduced power consumption through some improvements in the Linux kernel uh, that impacts power usage in Tencent data centers. Simple software fix, this one fix, these developers were able to save 240,000 tons of carbon emissions just through a simple software fix. Just, it's amazing the power of open source and how just a little bit of software can actually have a big impact on things like climate change. And the reason for that is because open source software is really a foundation, a fundamental base of all modern technology products and services. You know, today, if you're building a mobile device, a web application, a set of cloud infrastructure, you take, you know, Linux and open source uh, platforms, you use tools like Kubernetes, you might choose a language framework like Node.js, you're able to pick from various different packages that solve problems in open source, and you can focus just on the 10% of software that's custom for your customers, for your constituents, if you're a government, uh, for your users. Open source really allows industry and society to focus on the most important software while sharing the rest of the software together. The good news is that open source continues to grow. Every day, thousands of new open source projects are created on platforms like Git, GitHub, GitLab, many different places. And this is great because it gives us so many options when we're building new technology products or services. But it also creates sort of a paradox of choice. Which open source project should I choose? What's the right one? Is this open source project well supported? Is it going to last for a long time? And it turns out, even though there are millions of open source projects, there's a much smaller number of open source projects that are really critical to industry. And that's what we're gonna be talking about this week at this event. Those important projects like Kubernetes, like Node.js, like Linux, that we all depend upon, that require a community like this to sustain it. And that's really our job at the Linux Foundation, is to build reliable, successful ecosystems. You know, we work with the most important open source projects, and those projects are used to create products. You know, products like WeChat, Tencent uses these, you know, Alibaba uses the, Huawei uses open source to create mobile devices, automobile experiences, and so forth. And those products that are made using open source get improved by improving the open source software itself. And the 
improvements create better profits, better efficiency for the companies that are depending upon it. What happens then is companies make money selling products based on open source, they reinvest, they contribute back to the project those improvements, those improvements beget better products, more profit, better project, more pro better product, more profits, better project, more products. It's that positive innovation feedback loop that really creates the sustainability and the rapid innovation that we see across these critical open source projects. And we are seeing an amazing set of new projects. The Linux Foundation in 2023 is busier than we've ever been. Every day, a new organization joins one of our project communities. Every day, hundreds of thousands of developers work within our communities. You know, the Linux Foundation is a lot more than Linux in 2023. We host a thousand critical open source projects in dozens of vertical industries. This is only a small sample. Projects that all of you rely upon every day. In cloud computing, Kubernetes and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a part of our organization. We have telecommunications and networking projects that run the telecommunication infrastructure that billions of people rely upon to communicate every single day. In the energy sector, we're working with national grid providers, national energy companies, who are modernizing the way they distribute power and energy across their country. By modernizing the way that we are able to supply energy across large areas, using innovative software, open source software, we're able to greatly reduce energy waste. These are just a few of the examples of projects at the Linux Foundation that we get to work on every day. And that work is large. Every day, hundreds, over 700,000 contributors work in our open source projects. Thousands of companies are employing developers who contribute code to Linux and Kubernetes and more. Millions of pull requests, millions of builds, lots of security work. It takes an incredible effort to build these critical foundational open source technologies. In fact, one thing I thought about is if you look at the number of developers that are working across all the Linux Foundation ecosystem, and you multiply the number of those developers times the average engineering salary for a software developer, or for the lowest maybe being in a country like Nigeria, the highest in the United States, the average global software developer is it's somewhere around 40,000 US dollars. If you multiply the number of developers in our community times the average salary of a software developer around the world, the combined payroll would be over $26 billion. Think about that. What's interesting is Microsoft, which is the largest software company in the world, has a combined research and development payroll of about $24 billion US dollars. So I think technically that makes the Linux Foundation actually the largest software company in the world. But the good news for us is none of the developers who work in our community actually work for the Linux Foundation. They're all of you who work for amazing companies from all over the world, here in China, Baidu, Alibaba, Huawei, China Mobile, Tencent, and many, many more. It's just an incredible effort. The other thing we do at the Linux Foundation, in addition to managing open source projects, is we make new markets, right? We create entire ecosystems. Go back 10 years and think about how 
cloud applications used to be built. Right? We took servers, we virtualized them, and we deployed them as virtual machines in cloud infrastructure, basically. When the Linux Foundation worked with the CNCF community, we worked to create an entirely new way to create cloud applications, moving from virtual machines to containers to cloud native to completely change the way that cloud computing works, to open up new opportunities for cloud computing providers. And we've done this over and over again in automotive initiatives where we're working to use open source to create that in-vehicle cockpit experience with automakers who are using it in millions of production automobiles. Today, the Linux Foundation works with film and entertainment companies, companies like Lucasfilms, Pixar, DreamWorks, the folks that bring you the Marvel movies and the Star Wars movies. Our Academy Software Foundation has worked with film studios to open source the software that's used to create those amazing visual effects that we all enjoy when we go and see Avatar or Spider-Man. That's just how critical open source has become to every major industry. So today, one of the things I wanted to talk to all of you about are what are some interesting new areas that we're seeing at the Linux Foundation in open source innovation? And i am just picked a few of these projects. There's so many, we're launching a new project almost every week, but I wanted to pick a few that I thought might be interesting for you all to start out. One of the fun things about my job is I get to learn about exciting new innovation and new open source projects earlier than almost anybody else, right? Because organizations come to us and they say, hey, we've got this great idea. We want to create an open source large language model. We want to create a standard for 3D graphics. We want to have an open source semiconductor platform in RISC-V. And so I wanted to share a few of these today with you so that you can start looking at some new ecosystems to come. First, large language models and artificial intelligence are on everybody's mind today. And we're seeing an amazing amount of activity with large language and machine learning and AI technology. But we haven't yet seen a large language model enter an open source foundation. You know, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of open technology and open LLMs in terms of code, but not large language models that are collectively owned in a neutral organization that give everyone confidence that they can invest in that foundation model and be on equal footing with everybody else. RWKV is one of the first large language models that we're having enter the Linux Foundation through our Linux Foundation AI and big data effort. It's definitely one worth checking out on Hugging Face and GitHub there. Another exciting new project uh, that we're looking on at working on is AOUST. So this is a universal scene descriptor technology that provides developers, content creators, movie makers, people creating video games, uh, augmented reality experience with a standardized way to describe, compose, and simulate 3D environments. This is critical because it allows for creators to have a standard way to move 3D objects, 3D components across different platforms and ecosystems. This is a project that will rapidly enable innovation in film production, in the metaverse, and in gaming, augmented reality. It is definitely a project worth watching. It's supported by some of the largest companies in the world, including NVIDIA, which is one of the largest providers of 3D accelerated computing platforms. It's definitely worth watching. Common cloud controls. 
is a new project that provides a standard way to have cybersecurity resilience and compliant controls for common services across different cloud service providers. This is important. In the United States, we see a lot of end users taking a multi-cloud approach, and they need a standardized way to handle security problems as they arise across different platforms. Kubeflow is a project I'm super excited about. It's making the deployment of machine wor learning workflows on Kubernetes simple, portable, scalable. This is critical in order to reduce the cost of producing li uh, language models and so forth and machine learning uh, infrastructure. And finally, we have a new interesting semiconductor-related project called RISE, which is enabling a standardized open source ecosystem around the RISC-V platform. You know, when you're building a new semiconductor ecosystem, the important thing is to have a common set of software reference implementations that make it easy for people to take a RISC-V board and make something interesting from it because there's already an agreed upon set of software that enables that. The RISE project does just that. We also have some new and exciting projects coming out of Europe. Last year, the Linux Foundation created Linux Foundation Europe. This is a sister organization to the Linux Foundation in Europe with European members who are able to work both in Europe and join all of the global Linux Foundation projects worldwide. And our European friends are innovating at a fast pace already. Just these, this year, we've seen new projects like Camara, which is a set of open APIs for networking and telecommunications. Silva, a cloud software framework and reference implementation for telecommunication edge workloads. This next one I'm really excited about, the Unified Acceleration Foundation. This is a standard way to enable accelerated computing workloads on different semiconductor platforms. Companies like Qualcomm, ARM, Intel, and others are working so that we can use a wide variety of choices in semiconductor technology to create large language models and take advantage of the accelerated computing functionality that you really need to do that. Our Open Wallet initiative is an interesting project supported by companies like Google, Microsoft, to create a standard reference implementation for your digital wallet. Every day, people reach for their wallet in their mobile device. The typical physical wallet is going away in exchange for a digital wallet. And now, your identity, your credit cards, all of those things in your physical wallet need a standard way to exist in your digital wallet that's open, that everyone can take advantage upon and create wonderful services. This is definitely a project to watch as more and more governments around the world create digital identity solutions that will be stored in a wallet, as we see more digital financial transactions enabled through mobile devices and digital wallets. So it's definitely one worth watching. And finally, open tofu. Uh, this is a essentially, you know, straight up drop-in replacement for Terraform. Uh, about a month ago, HashiCorp changed the license for Terraform to a non-open source license, and a group of developers and industry partners decided to create Open Tofu, which is a completely open, neutrally housed uh, project at the Linux Foundation uh, that replaces uh, Terraform uh, and will be open under an open source license forever. Finally, the final trend I want to share with you all today, and we're going to hear more about it from a lot of the speakers here this week, is open source in AI is a critical component to enabling us to take advantage of all the exciting innovation in AI. You know, 
if you think about it, just since Llama 2 dropped and people had access to that code, developers were able to take it and getting it, get it run on a Raspberry Pi in the first couple of weeks. They were able to, at a very low cost, train that model to have really high performance. We've just seen an amazing growth in every single component in the AI and machine learning pipeline of open source projects to help handle the interesting challenges in this area. One other interesting thing we're seeing in the area of AI is the growth in large data sharing efforts. What we're really seeing is a lot of companies and organizations coming to us and saying, hey, we don't want to just share software in AI, we, in, in creating large language models, we want to share data as well. To respond to that, we created a new community data license agreement at the Linux Foundation. This is a open source-like license, but instead of for software, it applies to data. It's an easy way for organizations to share data openly with other organizations. Our first big example of this is our Overture Mapping Foundation. Overture Maps is a data sharing effort between Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, and TomTom in Europe to create a large, high fidelity data set of geospatial data that can be used to train models that will help with better uh, mapping services, better augmented reality experiences, and more. I wish I could cover every single trend that's going on in artificial intelligence right now as it relates to open source, but there's so much innovation and so much activity, it would take me several hours to go through each of these things. I think it's worth kind of reflecting upon just how fast the growth in the developer community has been in terms of contributions to AI and data projects in open source. Just a massive increase every year, and we see that continuing to accelerate. We still have a lot of challenges in the open source community. We need to make sure that the open source code that we all depend upon is secure. We need to make sure that the open source code that we all depend upon is distributed in a secure manner. But most importantly, in my opinion, the number one challenge, and the number one thing that we need to remember is we have to preserve the free, open, organic exchange of ideas that open source represents. The most important part about open source is that because it's freely available, anyone from anywhere, doesn't matter what country you're from, it doesn't matter where you live, if you know a little bit about software, you can participate. You can contribute, you can take that software, you can use it for anything you want. You know, it's been so long since I've been to Shanghai, and it seems like the world is divided and we're so far apart from each other, but I think I'm really, really lucky to be working on one of the things in the world that we can all agree upon. We can all agree upon open source, freely available, critical to society, is something we can all collectively work on, no matter who we are, no matter where we're from. And that's one of the most important things I want you to all continue to focus on all week. We've got so much amazing technology to go over, so many great sessions. It is an honor to be here in China. I want to thank you all for coming here, and I wish you the best at this event.